A very good morning to all of you. I'm sorry that we have to wait for another 10 minutes before we start. In the meantime, I'm sure all of you are aware that CSI IT 2020 is the annual technology conference. It is the flagship of the Computer Society of India Mumbai chapter, which is held every year with themes which are latest, contemporary. This time the theme is cognitive technology, business transformation through cognitive technologies. 2016, we had held the same conference with the theme, Big Data Analytics and Cybersecurity. While in 2015, when our Prime Minister was talking about smart cities, we had the theme of our conference was Challenges for Smart India. And we had taken the best of the speakers from around the country. And I assure you that even these two days, today and tomorrow, for business transformation through cognitive technologies, we have the best talent from around the country to enlighten you on the various aspects Friends, change is the only permanent thing in this world. And as Sir Alfred Lord Tennyson said, old order changeth, yielding place to new, lest one good custom corrupt the whole world. And the biggest game changer today is technology. With IoT, AI, virtual reality, augmented reality, number of tools at its disposal being developed year to year, day by day, month on, and with number of stalwarts from the industry picking them up and coming out with good applications. It is technology which is changing the face of the world day in and day out. I would request Mr. Abraham Koshi, Chairman, CSI Mumbai Chapter, and Country Manager Open Group, as well as Professor Kannan, Professor IIT Bombay, to lead the following guests to the dais. Mr. Koshi, Mr. Abraham, uh, Mr. Kannan. Sir, I request you to lead Mr. James De Rave, Vice President Open Group, and Mr. Nitin Sawant, Chief Guest, Managing Director from Accenture to the dais. Let's have a big round of applause for all of them. Just a prelude. Just as the audience, the stalwarts of the industry have to reschedule their programs. People flying in from Bangalore, our chief guest just arrived last morning, I should say, from San Francisco to put forth to us, to give us the enlightenment in the most frontline areas.
I would request Mr. Rajiv Desai to felicitate to come up to the dais and felicitate Mr. James Dereev, Vice President of the Open Group. Mr. James Dereev is Vice President and General Manager of the company, the Open Group. He is responsible for developing Open Group activities and membership in India and for the development and operation of all the open groups certification programs from Unix to TOGAF, plus new skills and experience based programs for IT and enterprise architects, open CA, and for IT specialists, open CITS. He originally joined XOPEN, which merged with OSF to form the open group to manage the development and distribution of what became the unique test suits. He then developed the testing business and evolved it into product and people certification, both from open group standards and a service to other consortia. Rajiv Desai, please. Let's have a loud round of applause. Next, I would request our chairman, Mr. Abraham Koshi, to felicitate our chief guest, Nitin Savant, who is the managing director of Accenture. I mentioned that he has flown down from San Francisco early morning. Nitin has vast experience in analyzing new business opportunities, <laughs> developing effective marketing and sales strategies, work with customers to develop product offerings in these practice areas, building their competency strategy, and come out with roadmap for technology growth. As head of the advanced technology and architecture practice at Accenture India, he provides senior leadership in the development of integrated digital roadmaps for large customers managing technology vendor relationships, evaluation and recommendation of technologies to fulfill customer challenges, develop and maintain a knowledge repository of architecture artifacts and lessons learned, conducting research and case studies on lead edge technologies and identification of technology trends and platforms in the advanced technology areas of digital architecture, user experience, cloud pass, DevOps, application modernization, artificial intelligence, and cognitive technologies. Let's have a big round of applause for our chief guest, <laughs> Mr. Nitin Shavan. That's all. Two felicitations. Now I invite Mr. Abraham Koshi, Chairman of CSI Mumbai Chapter, to deliver the welcome address. Mr. Nitin Savant, Mr. James T. Rave, Professor Kannan, Pramod Ambekar, Professor Gupta, members of CSI, the 
fellows of CSI, and guests. I know that many of you know CSI and its background, but there may be some of you who may not have an idea about CSI and its past, what it stands for and what it does. So let me just brief you something about CSI that you know what CSI is all about. CSI has a very long history that, frankly, it is uh, entwined with the computer um, innovation, its discovery, or its, its uh, making in India. It all started somewhere near when our freedom struggle was happening. The thought of starting something in the area of computer. I don't know whether you have heard of someone who started the Indian Statistical Institute. His name was uh, P.C. Mah Mahana Lobis. As a young individual, he was studying in King's College, London. And then he came across Professor Srinivasan Ramanujam, you all have heard of him, who was teaching in Cambridge. To Mahana Lobis, Ramanujam became a guru. And Ramanujam was following what was happening in India and its indep independence. As a patriot, what he has done is encouraged the Mahana lobbies to come back to India and continue his research in computing in his alma mater, which was Presidency College in Calcutta. As a professor there, he started something called a laboratory, a computer laboratory, and, and later he was the one who started Indian Statistical Institute. There, he got few professors and started researching and developed in their laboratory the first analog computer. It was a, a calculator, a glorified calculator, but it was the first analog computer in India. And he, he had, that was developed by a professor called Professor Mitra. Professor Mitra and Mahana Lobis became so popular that a group of other professors who were interested in computing joined together and they formed something called a computer um, computer users group. That was somewhere in 19, late 1930s. The first computer, however, was uh, the analog computer came in 1953, which was followed by TIFR, and in 1956, I think, uh, the, the digital computer came into being. And that was initiated by uh, uh, Professor Rangaswamy Narasimhan. By the time the computer users group became a body of very senior professors and scientists. And that is about the time, close to 1960, government of India decided that government should start using computer. That created a problem with the labor unions. And there was a law in 1960s. If you are those of who, whom you are there, they know that in 1960 there was a huge strike, going for months and months, because people were afraid of computer. Computer was going to take away all the jobs in the government. 
That was their fear. So at that time, government approached the computer users group and said, look, we are having a problem implementing this in government offices, municipality offices, in industries, because there is so much of resistance. Then, computer users group said, okay, we'll do one thing. We will go to all the government offices, go to the municipality offices, industries, and take the fear out of them by going and demonstrating and propagating the advantages of computer. And by 1965, the Computer Users Group turned into the Computer Society of India and registered as a non-profit body in Hyderabad. DRDO was behind it in Hyderabad. That is the beginning of Computer Society of India. This was seeded by most fertile scientific minds of India. And they continue to teach computer applications in all the government offices, in industries, and started teaching students in colleges. And till this, this day, Computer Society is very active in propagating knowledge, advancing knowledge of professionals as well as students. That is the background of Computer Society of India. Today, Computer Society has associations with other computer societies in the world. Australian Computer Society, Singapore Com Computer Society, Malaysia, uh, Britain, all these computer societies are affiliated to the Computer Society of India. Besides, Computer Society also have tie up with IEEE, PMI, and Memorandum of Understanding with uh, Infocom University and the Open Group. Hmm? Isaka, yeah, Isaka too, sorry. Mumbai chapter of, uh, no, before I go to Mumbai chapter, Computer Society now operates in 72 different locations in India, different towns, and they are called Computer Society's chapters. You are now with Computer Society of India, Mumbai chapter. Mumbai chapter has about 42 colleges out of the 50, 40 colleges, out of the 52 colleges, and we have branches in these 40 colleges. Each branch has a minimum of 75 students, but normally a branch in Mumbai has about 250 to 300 students as members of CSI. We also have a membership strength of about 7,000 members in Mumbai, all art professionals. What does CSI Mumbai chapter do? CSI Mumbai chapter continuously conducts workshops and training for professionals. And we are active in almost all the colleges, including those where we are not members. Uh, we don't have a branch. We are operating there. The colleges where there is no branch is because there aren't 75 students who have become members. The moment they become, uh, there is, they cross 75, then that college also will become a member of the Computer Society of India. Is that all what Computer Society does? No. We also work with the government of India, government of uh, various other states. For instance, now, just recently, government of India decided that we should modernize, modernize our Govern, governing system as a whole. Because what is hap happening in India is that one department doesn't know what the other department is doing. There is no integration. 
There is no common thinking. There is no top to bottom or bottom to top communication happening. In such stages, situation, what is to be done? Then, Ministry of uh, um, IT realized that there is something called enterprise architecture, which architects the whole enterprise, or in this case, the government. And it's supposed to, when it is fully implemented, think as one for the benefit of all. That is something which came to being. Government invited people from various industries, various departments, and also invited CSI and the Open Group, who are actually the leaders and the, and the thought leaders in enterprise architecture. CSI happened to be represented in the committee, national committee, that developed the e-governance reference model, e-governance model for the whole of India. This is something which is very unique, which was not something which we were doing earlier. But government has, after so many years, come back to CSI and put trust in them to be part of this, and this huge activity is to redesigning the governance of the whole country. Immediately after that, uh, sorry, the, that model, that reference model, is now available to you all as INDEA, India. It is available, and that is something which will be of interesting to those who are interested in uh, technology. Thereafter, CSI was invited by government of, government of Maharashtra. And today, CSI's members and the members of CSI, the companies who are involved with CSI, are sitting in government of Maharashtra's advisory body on redesigning the, the governance for the state of Maharashtra. This, as members of CSI Mumbai chapter, must be proud of, because we are actually doing something for the nation, for the state, as a think tank. What you, as a member, or even as a guest, can do. CSI is a forum where you can return to the society what you the society has given to you through your career, through your life, and its progress. I invite you, when you have free time and the inclination, please join hands with CSI and give to society what we have taken through our life. For putting forth the vision of CSI, and the vision of vision of CSI has been to upgrade the skills of the corporate workers, and also upgrade the employability skills of the students who are part of the student branches of CSI. Even non-members are often given consultations without any charges, and we see to it that they get their placements or internships as and when it is required. I would like to announce that recently we have put in place a student's placement cell under the aegis of Computer Society of India Mumbai chapter. We are working out the nitty gritties so that students from tier two, tier three colleges are also able to get placements in tier two, tier three, or even tier one industry corporates. Thank you, Mr. Koshi. And now I would invite the chairman of the organizing committee of the CSI IT 2020, Dr. Kannan Modgalya, to address the gathering.
Professor Kannan Mahadgalya is professor of IIT Bombay, and he has been instrumental in upgrading the lives of many youths and teachers all over the country through the prestigious programs that he nurses and organizes through FOSSI and spoken tutorials. In fact, recently, he also instigated the Computer Society of India that if we are able to train a large number of students in Drupal and Python, there are a number of jobs waiting for such students around the country. And we have taken up this particular training seriously, and I'm pleased to say, pleased to inform that we have had not only very good response from the students, but also from the placement agencies. Sir, please. Good morning. <clears throat> On behalf of uh, CSI, I would like to invite you all to this uh, conference. Um, I would also like to um, invite you on behalf of uh, the projects that uh, I represent here, uh, Spoken Tutorial and uh, FOSSI, which uh, aim at uh, promoting open source software. Um, IT 2020 is the annual technology conference of CSI. Uh, because of shortage of time, I would not dwell on it. Uh, you all know about it, and uh, it'll, for, you will get to see it in any case. I would only point out that um, lately, CSI has taken internship and placement as two focus areas. So I would like to uh, give a brief background to things that are happening in India and in the international scene, mainly from jobs point of view, how and what could be the role of CSI and uh, members of CSI and so on. So with that, I have about six points. So I thought I would just state them. The biggest, the first point is on the point of, on the issue of uh, loss of jobs. People have predicted that 40% of current jobs will go away because of automation. It is also predicted that sectors like artificial intelligence will become important ones. That is where new jobs will come and so on. So these are predictions, of course. I believe that the jobs that are going to be lost would be the jobs that can be automated, that can be low-level repetitive jobs that can be automated. So one way to address this is to move up the value chain. I've got some examples. Drupal was already mentioned. I also want to point out that one of the biggest contributors to Drupal community is sitting here on the dais, um, Accenture is one of the biggest contributors of, for Drupal applications. In fact, Drupal uh, lists that there are 67 active contributors to Drupal community. Then Django, Python, R, IoT, Linux, shell scripting. These are the things that are not going to be automated. I just, I'm just giving a few examples. The chief guest who could not come today, the CEO of BSC, migrated their system to Linux, and they are able to handle 400 million orders in a day. And this is a far cry from the 10 million orders that they were handling before and they shifted their whole system to Linux. It is the fastest in the world. Their ownership costs came down by 90%, and their hardware costs came down by 66%. Okay? 
Another example of Linux ownership, Linux usage, is the judicial system in India. All the 17,000 courts in India use Linux. Okay, it may be news to many people. It was it was news to me. Right. We are through the FOSI project. We are doing a study for the Maharashtra government, which is exploring the possibility of shifting to Linux. So the, that was the first one I wanted to talk about: loss of jobs, and that we need to aim a little higher than maybe that impact will be a lot less. The second point was to talk about the talk about other sources of jobs. Because I think that's going to be one of the major areas of interest or areas of concerns, areas of concern of CSI, how to give jobs to our students. I was talking to Dr. Ajay Kumar, who is the additional secretary in uh, Deity. Now it is called Mighty M for M Ministry. So he told me, so I was asking him the extent of open source usage in the government. So he said, 90% of most of the government projects, major projects, whether it is GST, whether it is Aadhaar, and so on and so forth, 90% of all they do is on Linux. He also pointed out that it's only the cloud that is still on Microsoft, and they are actually thinking about migrating that also. He also gave another interesting um, uh, statistics. He said at one point, 90% of users, computer users in NIC were Windows users. Now 90% are Linux users in the government, NIC. So here is an opportunity. We have to train our children for this. Linux is not taught at all in colleges, right? I uh, keep talking about Linux, open source, and so on, because these necessarily make the students, users, to play around with, fiddle with, download, take apart, put them together, which doesn't happen with proprietary software, which they can't even open. It's almost like giving a car to a mechanic and say, sorry, you can't open the hood. What kind of mechanic will he be, right? So here is something that you would want to, you would want your students, our students, to dirty their hands. And open source is the, uh, I would say, the best option. Mr. F.C. Kohli, who is the, whom we all consider as the father of Indian IT in India. About 15 years ago, he gave a talk in FC Kohli Auditorium, which was named in his honor in the Crescent Building. He said, the reason why China was advancing was that 90% of the software that they produce, in fact, more than 90%, maybe all of it, are used internally. Less than 10% is exported, whereas India exports most of the software that we produce. We use very little. In other words, the software that we produce to help others is not helping us. Okay? So we need to start using them. So that's a huge market. Whether it is uh, GST, imagine every company, every shopkeeper has to maintain their accounts. They need a programmer. And that is in Linux cloud. GST, Aadhaar, other things, electric cars, city redevelopment. Look at our, the state of our cities. They have to be redeveloped. Mr. F.C. Kohli also is uh, passionate about Indian technologies. There are many solutions to that. In spoken tutorial, we follow a very simple method, dub the spoken part in all 22 languages. Every one of our tutorial is available in many languages. Spoken tutorial is a 10 minute long um, 
tutorial, audiovisual tutorial. We call it spoken because you don't see my face. Okay, that's why it's called spoken. But there is an there is a video. You see the desktop. We have it on Drupal, Django, Python, or I mean all kinds of things. Whatever uh, people need. Going forward, natural language processing, automatic translation. These are something extremely important to our country to give jobs. Because it's only that way we can take the bottom 90% of the people with us. If we plan to work only with the top 10% of the people who speak English, we can never be a developed country. If we want to be a developed country, we have to take everybody along. We need languages. So that was the second point that I wanted to uh, mention. Second, uh, other sources of jobs. Then I want to talk about some of the uh, jobs that come from training. Training is a big activity. I'll give an example, some, uh, uh, something quite different from what we would normally talk here. I'm, my team, Spoken Tutorial team, is working with Dr. Rupal Dalal uh, in the field of nutrition, that we would create Spoken Tutorials to cover the mother's and baby's health for the first thousand days of a baby, from the time it is conceived, from the time of conception to thousand days. It turns out that if a mother knows how to feed the baby properly in the first six months, mother's milk alone is sufficient. Now, if you don't do this properly, you have to depend on supplement, food supplement. And if you have to buy good ones, it costs about 5,000 rupees during that six months per baby. That's a lot of money. More importantly, we don't have clean drinking water. We don't have clean water. You mix that food in dirty water, you know, the feed, uh, babies get sick. So we are, we are in the process of creating tutorials. She trains 1,000 mothers and volunteers every year. So we told her with our technology, we will scale it up 100 times. Instead of 1,000 mothers, we'll go to 100,000 mothers. Similarly, in another project, there is a doctor in Coimbatore who conducted a pilot for a whole year. He brought heart attack patients or people who are likely to get heart attack. He started the treatment in half the time, as it would normally take. Very simple, he just brought them in a special ambulance with ECG machine and so on, right? But so the treatment could start as the patient is brought in. That's how the uh, time was saved, and he could save 90%. He did a pilot for a whole year, and he concluded. Thomas Alexander is his name. The problem is how to train the paramedic who handles all this. It's a big problem. So we told them we will create spoken tutorials and give, and only people who know how to operate should be recruited. Now this can be scaled to all jobs that they have to, on, the, on day one, they have to demonstrate, yes, I can use your mission. Only then they get the job. So if they leave, there are several other people who are available. Where is technology? We need animations. We need Blender. We need lots of these animations. And we have lots of children. Okay, can we train them? So this is just an example. So there are a lot of things happening. And Point four, I believe that uh, an organization like CSI should look at training of major focus, training of 99% of students. What I mean is, what I mean by 99% is 1% is an institution like IIT. Then you have 99% all other institutions. Okay. The focus should be to train these 99% of the people, all except, let's say, IITs, and bring them to about half the level of 
let's say IIT level. Right now we say that education state, education is in shambles. It's a big gap. So can we bridge the gap? Can we bring them halfway? I believe that it is, lot, it is very easy to bring them halfway. Taking them to 99%, 100% is very difficult. Bring them halfway. But just because it is halfway, it is no mean thing because you have 10 million people whose average level of preparation is 50%. Then you can look at the top end of this large population. They'll be as good as that IIT graduates, if not better. So you don't lose anything. It is easy to do. Something like CSI should do that. Uh, I would like to give an example of this with, um, with the software that, I, that we pro uh, um, promote, software called Scilab, which is an open source alternative to MATLAB. MATLAB is very powerful, very expensive, very, very useful, but very expensive. I believe that most users in India, most users, that means 99% of the users, don't use even 1% of its capability. So given that, why not use Scilab? It turns out that we have created Scilab code for 65,000 examples from more than 550 textbooks. It covers most of science and engineering. It's already available. So in fact, I'm giving a talk on 12th to all colleges of our T10KT, train 10,000 teacher uh, training program of my colleague, Professor Fartek, I'm going to address these people, say that it is already available, come and use it. Anyway, you're using less than 1% of it. Whatever you do there, you can do here. It's available free of cost. It has been created by more than 1,000 students and faculty members of our country, created with MHRD's funding, come and use it. So that 99%, 1%, we should keep in mind, I would want CSI to look at that. In order to do all this, our students need laptops. All of our students, it turns out, I went through some statistics, most of our students, college-going students, definitely have a smartphone. But less than 10% of them have access to laptops. Laptops are a creative de device, where a, whereas a phone or, an, or a tablet is a consumption device. You cannot create, you cannot write a program, you cannot enter data. You can do that with great difficulty. So we have come up with a 10,000 rupee uh, laptop. I would want you to see it later. It's, uh, it runs Ubuntu right now, uh, 4 GB RAM, 32 GB NAND flash. It'll have a small extendable slot in which you can add 128 GB NAND flash if you want. That is extra. And, or you can put a 2.5 inch uh, hard disk. Uh, the most interesting thing is, uh, well, actually there are two interesting things. Lightweight, okay, 1.2 kg. The second thing is, it comes with a 10,000 mAh battery. In fact, we had done, a, um, we tested it thoroughly, and we found that stress test, we found that with full brightness and HD video streaming from internet, battery lasted eight hours. So for normal usage, I believe that it will easily last 12 hours, which means a student who goes to college in the morning by bus, comes back home at the end of 12 hours, can still use it can still use it. It is 10,000 10, rupees. I believe that, and we are going to do this without government support. So it is going to happen. Because there were uncertainties when we started with some of our projects. Interestingly, I, we studied the sufficiency of such a system earlier with a one-fourth power machine. It had one GB RAM, 38, 8 GB NAND flash, it had, uh, but it had 5,000 mAh battery, although the uh, it, battery time was, yeah, it was about half the time, maybe slightly less than one fourth, one third or so, four hours, five hours. That was 7,500 rupees. 20% of students who come to IIT Bombay in their first semester do not have their own laptops. I'm talking about IIT students. 20% of them don't have laptops. And they have CS 101. 
and I call it unfair competition. 80% of the students have their own laptops. These 20% of the students, if they get a doubt at 10 o'clock in the night, it will take only five minutes to verify, but you need a computer. You have to walk one kilometer across to the lab. And if it is raining in our monsoon season, those doubts will never get, those bright ideas will never get tested. What about our children in colleges? And their college buses leave at 5 o'clock in the evening. They don't have computers at home. So they think mugging up is programming, right? Because they don't have computer. They don't have access to computers. So it is extremely important. Last point about uh, business model. I keep talking about open source software. Does it mean that there is no business? Accenture is doing business. They are doing open source. How are they doing it? So it turns out that, that the applications that are heavily used, which are used to build custom models, the building blocks, basic building blocks, can still be open source, can be shared, and the community helps improving it. So your software, your proprietary software, which works on top of these, you keep getting better and better thanks to the community. Of course, that, that basic applications can be used by a lot of other people for a lot of other things. Our uh, Swakon tutorials uh, are released under CC BY SA Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License. That means anybody can use them, anybody can even make money out of them without giving a single paisa to us, can build other educational content was done so because of the government. Government asked us to do that, and they gave all the funding. The cost of training for us through that method, we have trained about 4 million students during the last uh, six years. Cost to train one student on one topic end of last year was 50 rupees, less than a dollar, whether it is PHP, whether it is Python, whether it is um, Drupal, whether it is Perl, uh, Ruby, and so on and so forth. Of course, C, Java, so on, Scilab. And I predict, how did I come up with this number? I just said, what is the total cost? Divide by the total number of people trained, that's it. I'm not even valuing the content that I created, the 8,000 tutorials that we have on our web page, about 50 different um, topics, all that I'm not counting. That it is available in 22 languages, I'm not counting, right? And I believe that it will come to about 25 rupees end of this year to train one person on one student, uh, uh, one person on one topic, and why can't it go to five rupees? Why can't it go to one rupee? You have to train so many people. So the business model is um, because we have numbers. We have numbers, and I believe that there is no conflict at all, okay? So with these words, I've already taken a lot of time. With these words, I would like to conclude this um, introduction session. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about how many people there are, about 30, 350 people have registered, there are many speakers, but then uh, you can see the list of speakers and what they are going to talk uh, in the list. Um, that, and more importantly, I would like you to stay for the entire duration and find out for yourself. Thank you. I'm sure we should have a louder round of applause for all the motivation and the facts that Professor Kannan has put before us. I would like to thank him for reminding us that Mr. F.C. Kohli is the founder member of Computer Society of India. We call him the Bhishma Pitama of IT industry. And about two years back, when we requested him to come, come over and we felicitated him, he was all praises for the present team of the CSI volunteers. I'm laying the stress on the word volunteers. And he appreciated the efforts that we are putting in. And we promised him that we'll carry forth the job and the motivation which he has left for us. Professor Kannan, you have given a lot of motivation, not in principle, but in, but in the actual work that, that you have already done, 
and you have projected and inspired us to do, we have fallen in line and we are trying to live up to your aspirations, sir. Let's once again give a big round, loud of applause. <laughs> and I'm sure all of us will take an oath in their mind that they would come out and help themselves as volunteers of CSI to let the organization forge ahead with such programs which we get from such great people amongst us. Moving over, as I would call it, I would now request Mr. James DeRave, Vice President and General Manager of the Open Group. I've already given the details of his profile. He would be talking on artificial intelligence, business and social challenges. Mr. James, sir. So, following the professor, um, who has this amazing ability to have this tiny little piece of paper with about three lines of almost indecipherable writing on it and then speak eloquently and intelligently and interestingly for 30 minutes. Um, I can't do that. Um, I have to use, I've decided not to present slides and to do something a bit more flowing. Um, I but to, I, I have to use PowerPoint to take my notes. <laughs> So, so I have my laptop here with my PowerPoint, but I'm not going to show you because they're just notes, uh, although the writing is mostly illegible. So um, I'm going to talk about a little about a lot of different things related to the challenges that AI brings us. Um, first, you know, down at the, you know, one reaction to what, what the professor also said, um, I'm astonished, and maybe it's because my hair is as gray as Professor Cannon, um, that a graduate can come out of a computer science course without being able to write a shell script. That's just boggling, or having some idea of operating system structures and architectures. I mean, how else do you build up your knowledge of how everything works? That's just, a, you know, it beggars belief. Anyway, and it's probably true in, in, in my country, in the UK as well. I'm sure that's also happening. I know my children, when they were at school, they did, um, uh, you know, they did courses in computing. It was part of the fundamental. What did they learn about? Spreadsheets and word processors from Microsoft. They know nothing about information technology. Ridiculous. And thank God they've changed that curriculum a bit. Um, so, some fundamentals. Um, AI, it consumes an awful lot of compute capability, capacity. Uh, the use of artificial intelligence, um, data mining, these big data lakes, all the algorithms that work on it, immense amount of compute. And we've come to kind of expect that compute is infinite. You know, the clouds educated everyone to say, well, yeah, we just bring in a bit more, pay a bit of extra, and we get the capacity, and it's all there. And it'll be taken care of by you know, Amazon or Microsoft or whoever. Well, it's true. That certainly has how it has been. But there is a collision coming. Um, we've basically become really too complacent about that. Um, as, the, as that capacity gets eaten by these ever more intensive applications, we're also stretching Moore's law. And we've become used to over the decades that Moore's law has astonishingly just kept holding true. Everything doubles every two years, prices go down, capacity goes up. There is a limit. I mean, the atom is the limit. So as the you know, feature, feature widths get smaller and smaller over time, the time interval between new releases and new, and, and new technologies increases, and there are limits approaching. So that is going to help halt progress at some point. There are new architectures being used. I was looking at some stuff on, on the web last night, um, memory-driven computing, task-specific processes. Uh, these can provide a lot of relief in an area where we were actually constrained by the, by the compute capability by enabling different ways of accessing the data. I was show, seeing an, an example of you know, a, a single board computer, okay, uh, an old term, four terabytes of memory, multiple processors, able to be stacked up into uh, a rack, 40 of the things, 160 terabyte, all addressable memory by all of the processors in the rack. Graphics processors, ARM processors, um, a, you know, a, a, a Intel core processors, all able to be able to access all of that memory, all in parallel. 
So those things are going to change the model of how we, um, of, of how we can get at that compute capability. But that again, is there are going to be limits. Then there's new physics. And while we stay with the basic silicon physics we've got, we've got those fundamental limitations of that physics. Quantum computing, I don't understand it. I'm sure some people here do. I'm told it's going to make, a, potentially has the potential to make a vast difference. So let's hope it can. Memristors, resistors that remember the current that was flowing through them that can be used for both computing and memory. Photonics, these things are gonna happen. They're in the lab today. There are working things in the lab today. And yes, there's a need for you know, million-fold scaling before they become commercially viable. But those things are going to come. Professor Cannon talked about people. And without the people, none of it happens. Where are those skilled people going to come from? Where are you going to find the machine learning scientists, the knowledge engineers, the data scientists, the mathematical modelers, the speech scientists? You look at what Amazon and Google are doing. They're building R&D centers near the best universities they can find in these subjects. Let's go where the people are. Let's create an attractive facility. Let's get them straight out of college. That's what they're doing. They're spending a lot of money on that. What's India doing on that? Where is India's artificial intelligence center of excellence? I did learn something about there's a thing called the Deep Learning Initiative. I wasn't really able to find out what it's doing and how it's doing, but is that going to be the center of excellence? Is that what, or is IIT going to start building centers of excellence in this? I read also Times of India in July, a headline in it saying, the dearth of AI talent, AI talent makes Indian companies scout for candidates abroad. So there's recruitment of expats and recruitment of you know, people from Europe and the US being brought into India to enable Indian businesses to tackle this business opportunity. The world is changing. Different topic, bias. I'm told that bias has a special word, special meaning to statisticians, and I'm probably therefore not going to use the word correctly. I'm sort of using it in the human sense of things not being quite right. I have a camera, not a very expensive, neat little piece of Panasonic. It's a Lumix it's a compact camera. It does astonishing things, you know, like, like most people's mobile phones do now, it'll recognize faces. And my wife is African, she's black. My children are mixed race. I take a photograph at a you know, Christmas lunch or a family get together. It recognizes the white faces. It doesn't recognize the black ones. That's bias, because it was trained, either it's trained on a particular sort of data set or the algorithms it's using to determine what the edge of a face is or what are the color of a face is, is biased, just is. There's a report that um, training data sets for, of, of images, the COCO and the in situ image collections, were used to train on recognition of gender. 100,000 images taken from the web. There was bias in the data because there were more images of men than of women, just because of the way where they collected those images. There was also in the report, it was talking about, well, there were a number of images of women in domestic situations, more so than men, and the number of images of men in work situations was greater than that of women. So they trained the recognition algorithms on this data set. It identified a man wearing an apron in the kitchen as a woman. Now that's something really potentially evil in there. I'm maybe using the word a little bit, exaggerating a bit for effect. But there is something really worrying if we're going to pass decision making to algorithms trained on data sets where we cannot in advance be sure that that data set is, quote, unbiased for the purpose of that algorithm. That's something we need to be worried about. These systems are going to be making decisions that affect our lives. They are today. You know, there, was a, there was a great com com comedy program in the UK a few years ago which had a repeated skit say, where the answer always was, computer says no. 
Something typed into the computer, the answer was no. No ability to interact, no ability to object, no ability to say, but you've got the information wrong, but that doesn't apply to me. The computer says, no, you don't get the service. Do we have a right to know why? Can we affect that? And what about the unintended consequences, the things we don't think about when we build these things? I mean, engineering is such a lovely thing to do. We build these wonderful systems, and they're fantastic, and then we haven't thought about what's outside the edges of those systems and what the consequences could be on, on the things they may or may not have been thought of touching. Trust. Does everyone here, who, who does not use Facebook here? Wow, some hands, brilliant, well done. <laughs> Real people, sorry, I didn't actually mean that. People able to detach from the digital world. Um, so all of those who are using it, do you trust it? Do you believe it? Facebook knows you. It knows what you want to read, what you want to see, what you want to talk about, who you want to talk to, who you want to listen to. It knows it. It has to know it to sell you ads. Well, it has to know that to be able to give you the ad that its customers are paying for you to see. It targets. And to target that, it has to know an enormous amount about you. So Facebook users live in a bubble, an insulated world. So they're surrounded by the people that they like to talk to, like to listen to, surrounded by the ideas they're comfortable with. And they don't, and that's in, it's an impervious bubble thing. Other things don't get in. It's almost like the power of gossip. Um, there was a report in the US of Facebook users. They were asked, um, you know, what do you trust more, the mainstream media or what you hear on Facebook? Well, Facebook comes from people I know. So the mainstream media with research departments, archives, reporters in the field, they're not believed. What someone you've never met, someone you don't actually know, who's, quotes befriended you on Facebook, or you trust them. And, and they haven't actually thought about what they passed on either. It's merely something that came from someone they had befriended. That's very, very, very dangerous. It's like the power of gossip, amplified to goodness knows what factor. I mean, it is gossip. And it's having political impact. Google. Who doesn't use Google? I try not to. I use a thing called Start Page. It's a front end to Google. It anonymizes your requests. So if you use start page, you put a request in, Google doesn't know who you are. So it just gives you an answer. Google has recorded everything you've ever asked it. And when you ask it something, it says, hmm, I know that person. I'm going to give them the answer they expect. Now, it's not that they're just feeding you just the stuff that they think you want. I'm exaggerating a little but there is bias in what they report to you that fits their view of who you are and what you're asking for. It knows where you've been. Use Google on your, la on, on your mobile. It knows where you are. It knows exactly what you've been doing ever since you started using Google on your smartphone. It remembers it all only to serve you better. Do no evil. I don't think they try and do evil. I think they're trying to be good. But the, the amount of information they hold about everybody is vast. So that makes me think a little bit about privacy. Um, I was pleased to see um, a few weeks back, maybe it was a couple of months, Supreme Court here decided that privacy is a right. That's going to have very interesting consequences for everybody that tries to do business in India. There's a, um, 
a law coming into force or a, or a directive in the European Union comes into force in March next year called the General Data Protection Regulation. It's worth reading. It's not very long. It's written in a you know, readable language. It's, um, you could argue it comes from the very far end of a spectrum of privacy concerns, where you might find, well, India currently is at the, or has been at the other end of that spectrum, and America also up there as well. The GDPR is from the very um, privacy concerned end of the spectrum. But it says things like individuals have a right not to be subject to a decision when it's based on automated processing. You have a right to be able to object and have that decision revisited. In the light of what I was saying about Google and Facebook and everything else that people like Walmart are trying to do, these are important factors. So a, a data owner must ensure that the people you hold data on must be able to obtain human intervention, must be able to express their point of view and obtain an explanation of a decision and challenge it. I think with the rise of AI, those things are absolutely crucial. Otherwise, the AI will be running our lives. Another key provision is you can, hold, you can find out what information people hold on you. There's a journalist, I read a report a couple of weeks ago, a um, journalist in the UK asked Facebook for a copy of the information that, that, that Facebook held on her. Um, she expressed great surprise when a 180-page document arrived in the post. I'm surprised it was only 180 pages. Free speech. Have you, um, some of you may have been following the, uh, you know, this Russian interference with Trump's election saga, which, which has its wonderful entertainment value, um, but has a very serious aspect to it. In one sense, there's nothing new. Russia and America have been trying to feed each other propaganda ever since the end of the Second World War, more or less effectively. You know, there was, there was a Radio America, or what it was called, broadcasting propaganda into Russia, and there was Russian radio broadcasting propaganda, and you've got the same now with television. You've got RT broadcasting um, propaganda in, in, in the US, and, and vice versa. So all, all that's, there's nothing new. What is new is instead of seeing this thing in print or hearing it from a Russian-branded um, news channel or an American-branded news channel where you kind of know what to expect, it's slipped in underneath people's filters because of the AI-based targeting and the channels being used, Facebook, and the personal bubbles in which people inhabit. It's getting through all those filters. It's coming from a friend. So moderation of fake news is going to need AI. It's way out of any kind of human management scale. It's going to need AI. So when does it become censorship? How do we manage that one? Driverless cars. I love the fact that India is probably the last country that's going to get driverless cars. Um, and, and when they arrive, because it's going to be mixed traffic, they're going to have a whole bunch of different sensors and actuators. They're going to have to blow their horn a lot. <laughs> they're going to have to listen to who's blowing the horn behind them to find out what's going on. It's, it's, a, it's great. Can you imagine the AI robot driving an, an auto? I think it's a wonderful thought. Um, but being more seriously, there was an accident with a Tesla. Um, guy going down a dual carriage, you know, a highway, not a lot of traffic truck pulled out in front and was blocking it. Big, white, articulated truck. The Tesla car drove straight into it on full auto. The guy was watching a movie. The driver had not read his manual. He hadn't realized he was responsible for avoiding such accidents because the Tesla auto system didn't recognize that that was an obstacle. Whose fault? I think the court case has concluded it wasn't Tesla's fault. And it was the driver's fault for not reading the manual and not supervising the car's automated driving. 
be serious. We get a fully automated car and we have to sit behind the steering wheel with our hands ready to grab it, watching what's going on all the time, otherwise it's our fault. What's the point of the thing? How can you have an automated taxi? Which is surely really the only point of having automated cars is to be so that you don't have to own one. You call one up and it only costs the car cost, not the people cost, and you can just get in, in anyway. Medical decisions. AI is going to be used for diagnosis and treatment recommendation. So who's liable in the mal malpractice suit? The data scientist? Or the doctor that said okay? Or is there a doctor that's going to say okay? How do we guard against artificial stupidity? People can be stupid. We're building these things to be intelligent, and they're only going to be, well, maybe they can be more intelligent than us, but I think they can probably be more stupid than us too. Note that DeepMind, the firm that Google bought, um, has an ethics division. It is researching ethics issues to do with artificial intelligence for the future. What happens when we reach the singularity, so-called, when AI reaches self-awareness and becomes more intelligent than we are? And what do the ex-drivers do? And it's becoming real. I mean, self-driving cars are a little way off. Self-driving trucks, they're trialing convoys in Europe at the moment. You've got a driver in the front truck, and you've got two or three behind that are on full auto. Follow within six feet. Shut up the highway. Saves fuel, because you're all slipstreaming. So it saves money, significant sums of money. What happened to the other two drivers? Well, right now, they've got to be sitting behind the wheel looking at the back of the truck in front, falling asleep. But where it's going is there'll be only one driver and then no drivers. So what do the drivers do? The number of truck drivers in the US, I, I was looking for the number, I haven't found it, but it's enormous. It's a huge business. People driving trucks and vans. Back in, in um, the Industrial Revolution, um, there was a bunch of people in the UK called the Luddites who protested against um, machinery being installed in, weaving, in the weaving trade. Um, the story is a bit muddy about exactly what they were protesting about, but the term has come to be used, people who object to new things, automation, machines, etc. You're just a Luddite. You don't, you know. I, won't, I, I won't use Facebook because I'm a Luddite. The argument against the uh, that objection, the argument for the innovation and for the replacement, the installation machinery and the displacement of people is there is a net benefit and there's a net economic benefit. The whole society becomes more wealthy. And that has been true in the past. New technologies come in, it changes things and the whole society improves. But there's a lag. How long before that benefit accrues? And what are you going to do with the people that are displaced during the lag? Or is for them the lag the rest of their lives? There's a demographic factor. This is fascinating. We have aging populations in much of the world. Increasing numbers of younger people are needed to provide care for older people. This is true in the UK, the US, most, you know, most of the rest of Europe. It's true in China. It's not true in India because you have such a much longer, younger population. What I found very interesting was I went on to the World Bank site, site and I looked for um, dependency ratios. You have your pop total population. What percentage of that population is of working age, which they defined as being between 16 and 64? Surprising numbers. In the UK in 1960, it was 54% were of working age. Last year, it was 56%. But we have an aging population. That can't be right. It's immigration. About 4% of that, 5%, is Eastern Europe, European immigrants into the UK who come in their 20s and 30s and do work. The US, 66% working population in 1960, 52% last year. China is absolutely astonishing. In 1960, it was 76% of the population was of working age. It's now 
And that's because of the one-child policy. That is age. It's not a lot of young people. That's age. Think of the pension implications. Think of the hospital medical implications, the elderly care implications. There's going to be jobs for Indians working in China taking care of old Chinese people. India, 1960, it was 77%. It's now down to 52. And I have to, uh, the only way I can rationalize that is there's a lot of people younger than 16. And maybe, I don't know what the average life expectancy is in India. And okay, in, in, in the UK now, it's in the high 80s, I think. Um, so in India, the, the dependency ratio is, is, is only 52%, but I think that's because there are a lot of under-16 dependents. That's my guess. I probably need to do some further analysis. But that, 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 those numbers and those thinking, those demographics, are going to radically affect the economic impact that artificial intelligence has upon this country and this community. Think also of the eroding tax base. It's only the earners that are paying income tax. Okay, here you don't have a big income tax take. It's mainly indirect, but it's only the earners that are earning the money that pays the indirect taxes. So if the dependency ratios keep falling, productivity has to go up, otherwise economic decline. Automation may therefore be a savior there. Automation, the whole case, yeah, we can increase, robots increase productivity. AI can make things more efficient. How do you distribute the wealth? It'll only work if the earnings from that additional productivity are distributed to the people and the states where the workforce has been displaced. Globalization works against that. There are ideas on... Um, a couple of countries have been trying things like basic income. Every citizen should get a minimum basic income that is enough to live on, irrespective of what they do. That's one thought. The thought that some politicians I've heard uh, talk about is, well, instead of just taxing the people, we should tax the robots. They should pay income tax too, because they're displacing workers and we need to keep the tax base up. So. I mentioned, when will it be that we are no longer the most intelligent people on the planet? This is what's driving Elon Musk. This is why he is putting his money, okay, and his investors' money, into going to Mars. He wants to build a lifeboat. He's really, really serious. And I end with a quote from him. I hope we are not the biological bootloader for digital superintelligence. So, thank you. James has given us different views and viewpoints of different aspects. And I'm sure all of you will agree, intelligence has always been the forte of human beings. And now we feel threatened that it is going to be encroached upon by technology. Let's give a big, round of loud applause for the thoughts expressed by James. Thank you so much, Mr. James.